2, Jonah. Chapter 2. This is a delightful, thinking about lunch, this is a delightful little chapter. And Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the stomach of the whale. And he said, I called out of my darkness to the Lord, and he answered me. I cried for help from the depth of Sheol, and he didst hear my voice. For thou hadst cast me into the deep, into the very heart of the sea. And the current engulfed me, and all thy breakers and billows passed over me. So I said, I have been expelled from thy sight. Nevertheless, I will look again toward thy holy temple. Water encompassed me to the very soul, and the great deep engulfed me. In other words, he's drowned. Weeds were wrapped around my head, and I descended to the root of the mountains. The earth with its bars was around me forever, but thou hast brought up my life from the pit, O Lord. Even whilst I was fainting away, I remembered the Lord, and my prayer came to thee up to his holy temple. Those who regard the vain idols forsake their faithfulness, but I will sacrifice to thee, O Lord, with the voice of thanksgiving. That which I have vowed to you I shall pay, for salvation is from the Lord. And with this the Lord commanded the great fish, and it vomited Jonah up onto dry land. <laughs> Metro Diner. <laughs> Stop it. This is almost comical, <laughs> in a sense. And, you know, people will say, well, this ain't true. It could never happen. Huh? You never know. Stranger things out in that ocean than we can even imagine. Uh, remember last week, Jonah got on the boat, and the boat got into a storm. <clears throat> And it's very interesting that the sailors, remember, the sailors last week became very afraid. Now, let me ask you a question. How many sailors have ever become afraid of a storm? Well, I think. I mean, maybe at one time when they're young, but as you do it your whole life, they become pretty commonplace. And I've known a few guys in the middle of hurricanes, 30, 40, 50 foot waves, and <clears throat> the destroyers are banging down on those things, trying to get through them. And, uh, you know, they get to the point where they just think, you know, it's a storm, it'll pass. Uh, we're still afloat, we're not in the water, and this is their mindset, we're not in the water, so we don't have to worry about it. Two, two things fear the, the sailor. Number one, actually, is fire. Because if your boat's on fire, you're in a lot of trouble, especially in the old days when they were made out of wood. But even the steel ships today, they get on fire, things tend to explode, and it puts holes in the boat, and it sinks. So if you're on fire, that's the number one fear of any sailor in the world. If the Navy does one thing right, it is fire suppression. They have men on those aircraft carriers down to the littlest tugboat that know what they're doing should a fire break out. The second thing is, of course, losing the ship. If you lose the ship and you're out in the middle of the ocean, well, what are your chances? They'll tell you. They'll tell you very little. Because <laughs> there's a whole lot of things in the ocean that like to eat stuff. And you are stuff. <laughs> so they became sorely afraid, but their ship's not on fire and it's not in the water yet. You see what I'm saying? So something else there, this must have been one heck of a storm. I mean, it's greater than what they had ever seen. We're probably, here we're talking about, give or take, I'm not sure, don't hold me to this, but I'm saying 60, 70 foot boat. 80 maybe, if it was a big freighter. These guys were what would nowadays be called the merchant marine. They, they were traders. They, they went to this port, filled it up with bananas, went to this port, bought, sold the bananas, filled it up with a, you know, iron and brought it back over here, sold the iron and filled it up with something else. And, and back and forth they went. This wasn't, the Tarsus was a very uh, strong seaport and very strong trading city. And then just around from that was Ephesus. And these guys sailed that coast all along. And then over to uh, 
Joppa, which was on the coast of Israel. So these are, it's not like, let me try and do this. Okay. This is uh, modern day, what we call Turkey. This was Ephesus right here. E-P-H, Tom. E, whatever. That's Ephesus. Uh, very huge, because over here was Greece with Athens and, and all them. And the trade between them is incredible, you know. So here was Tarshish. Here was Joppa, basically. Here was Israel. So that's your map. So these guys would sail, and it wouldn't be a terrible sail. It would just be kind of like one of these things. And then it would be back and back and back, and they've probably done it seven billion times. That's what they do. That's what they do for a living. They trade uh, with this and this, probably pick up arms and stuff from here. It was a very strong, both of these were very strong Roman-occupied uh, trading centers and all the good stuff from here then would go on over to Rome. So this is what we're talking about. A lot of people put Paul way out here in the middle of the ocean. That's not the, probably not the case. Or that Paul, when he went to Rome, didn't go that way either. He probably went like that. But anyway, so Jonah could be in here somewhere. You know, here's, here's his boat. Which anytime your boat goes down, that's not good. But it's not terrible. In other words, there probably could have been or would have been a lot of boat traffic in that area. There wasn't just this one boat. It was obviously a boat for hire. He paid the price, he got on. He went down in the boat and went to sleep. Obviously the storm didn't bother him until the sailors woke him up and said, are you the cause of this storm? Well, They all then, what did the sailors do? Well, they became afraid and they prayed to their gods. Now, we don't know what gods those were, but we are told they prayed to their gods. Second question. <laughs> how many sailors do you know are that afraid of a storm? Second of all, how many sailors do you know pray to the god? <laughs> Oh, they're shouting his name, but I don't think it's in a reverent way. So these guys are praying to their God. Thirdly, they threw their cargo overboard. It must have been one heck of a storm. If they thought, let's throw the cargo, the stuff that we're responsible for, the stuff that we paid for and we need to sell up here, let's throw it over so that we can stay afloat and weather this storm. <coughs> they threw their stuff over. What sailor do you know is going to throw his cargo his whole life overboard? Unless it meant life or death. That's good. Huh? A scared one. <laughs> a scared one? I don't know if they'd even do that then. <laughs> uh, it's awful hard to let go of that golden coin, you know, when it's in your hands. Like the old adage, you put, you, you put, fill a jar with nice gumballs and the kid sticks his hand down there and grabs a whole fist of them and then try to get his hand out. And he can't. The only way he can is to let go of the gumballs, then he can get his hand back out. Uh, and we teach our children that kind of stuff. Sometimes life deals you. Well, these guys throw all their stuff over. Then they find Jonah sleeping. And then they decide to cast lots. A lot is like a, a, a divining stick. It's a little stick about that long and they would cast it and it would come in and it would point out or show or direct you to who's causing the problem. It was just an ancient divining way that they used to do that. And of course, God, our God, does not get into all that nonsense. But sometimes he uses that, uh, lets these guys use that to point out his, his purpose. 
It's Jonah. Remember, Jonah's running away from God. Jonah was told to go to Nineveh, way up here, the capital of the Assyrian Empire. He didn't go that way. He came over to the coast, to Joppa, and he got on a ship and tried to hide from God. So, even after his declaration, and I want to put that in there, he, he says, I'm probably your problem, boys. Even after his declaration, they said, no, you're not the problem. And they rowed even harder and harder trying to save the ship. And he even said, if you throw me overboard, your problems will probably be over. And they said, no, we're not going to do that. And finally, they, to be sure, they cast the lots. It points to Jonah. And then they pray to God again. And they say, Lord, don't make us responsible for this man's blood. Then they throw him over. And immediately the storm was gone. It was nice and soft. You know what's also ironic? This part of the region is very desertous. Not a whole lot of bad storms in that region of the world. And the reason is because of the mountains here, the desert dry and the high coastal. So this little corner of the Mediterranean doesn't really get a whole lot of storms. That may be why they were so afraid. So when they got into this mess, it was probably an anomaly, not the norm. It was probably that they were sitting there going, what the heck? And they were wondering. You know, now if you look at the coast of Florida and a big storm came up, well, happens all the time. We got thousands of Spanish galleons down here on the bottom of the ocean. I mean, they sink all the time. They got wrecked all the time. That was no big deal. But in this area, it's like expecting a snowstorm in the middle of the Saudi Arabian desert. And all of a sudden it starts snowing. Like this past winter, or last month. Big snowstorm in Hawaii. And everybody's out there, you know, wearing their coconuts and their grass skirts going, what the heck is this? It was an anomaly. It was some weird tropical something, something, something that snowed three, four inches on Hawaii. In Hawaii? On Hawaii. Yeah. All those little coconut ladies were upset about it. <laughs> But, you know, you never know. Maybe God was trying to teach somebody something out there in Hawaii. I don't know. So everything about this is not right. You understand what I'm trying to say? Mm -hmm. Everything about this is not normal. And then there in the middle of the whole thing is this little Jewish kid who ran away from God. Now, he goes into the water. He's drowning, obviously. You heard his prayer from the fish. I was covered by the billows, by the waves and the water. Seaweeds wrapped around my head. I was going down for the last time. You know, I saw the light at the end of the tunnel, the whole nine yards. And then a giant fish came. I'm not very good at a fish. And ate him. And he went down here, and he met Pinocchio <laughs> in the belly of Monstro. Remember your childhood <clears throat> stories. And it's from the belly of the fish. Three days passed. You know, he should have been right by then. wonder what he told his wife when he got home. Where have you been? Three days in a whale, man. <laughs> yeah, right. I'm buying that one. <laughs> <laughs> what was her name? Three days in a whale, and he prays, and the prayer we see this morning is desperate to the Lord. How about that? You know, Jonah, everybody says, oh, wasn't he a great guy calling on his God? Let me ask you a question. How many options did he really have? <laughs> Think about it. No, none. Uh, less than none. You know, in another day or so, he's going to be fertilizer on the bottom of the ocean if he doesn't get out of that fish. Let's face it. So I'm really not saying that Jonah was a spiritual giant. 
He was just a kid, a Joe Blow, that didn't want to do what God wanted him to do. And God was determined to say, when I want something done, I want something done. Do you understand? How many guys face that in a Bible? Every single one of them. Gideon. How many men you got, Gideon? 30,000. How many are you going against? 50,000. All right, tell, take all your men down to the stream. Those who kneel on their foot to drink, send them home. Those who just lap up the water with their hand, keep them. And he does this. Well, he sent 25,000 guys home. So he's saying, Lord, how many men you got, Jonah, or Gideon? He says, well, I got 5,000 now. How many are you going against? 50,000. Okay, do this. And he does that. And, well, he ends up, long story short, he ends up with 300 guys. He says, Lord, I got 300 guys against 50,000 or whatever. He says, now we're ready to go to war. What? That's an impossible thing. <coughs> well, a whole lot of this <coughs> is impossible. And Gideon, well, he wasn't in the belly of a whale, but he probably would prefer the belly of a whale to facing a, an army that outmans, outguns him a, a thousandfold. You see what I'm saying? God sometimes calls us to impossible places and says, okay, big boy, let's see what you got. You say you trust me. Well, we're going to find out today, aren't we? And he calls upon the Lord. Now, given the fact he had no options, that's not really a giant theological monumental conversion. Not yet. But he was at least smart enough to say, boy, I finally surrender. And that's what it's all about. Surrendering that I can't do it myself. I can't control my life myself. I can't get to eternal life myself. I can't get off this planet myself. If God does not save, and the scriptures speak this so clearly, if God does not save, you cannot be saved hundred different ways he says that throughout scripture. If I don't build the house, the house ain't going to be built. If I don't plant the fields, you're not going to grow anything. If I don't, if I don't, if I don't, over and over again throughout all of scripture from Genesis to Revelation, God says, if I'm not involved, L-B-E-D, you are wasting your time. Build your house on the Lord. That's like the solid ground. Anything else is sinking sand over and over and over again. In other words, God is saying to you, he's saying to me, and he's saying to this idiot fish that God is not and never has been an option. He simply is. God is. God isn't something you decide upon when you get around to it. God is not something you might listen to if you want to. God is not somebody you'll pay attention to if only you benefit from it. When God calls, it's time to move. It's time to walk. It's time to run. It's time to fight. It's time to do whatever He's asking you to do. And you know what? If you go throughout the Scriptures from now all the way to the end, God has, and I'll even back this up with my own life, when God wants you to do something, He will make it most plain to you. There will be no doubt in your mind. I used to love my dad. He would look and he'd say something and I'd go, but dad, but dad, but dad. No but dads. Well, why do I go? Because I said so. When do I have to? Today, now, right now. I want it done by the time I get home. And then, of course, he'd always ask that final question. 
Is there any question at all? What Dad used to do was take away every one of my options. And then he'd say, now you act. Well, if you act correctly, things will probably go well. If you act incorrectly, things are probably going to get ugly. But then again, God's in charge, not us. What does that mean? Well, that involves a certain surrender to that authority. If nothing else, this story shows how God can take a little wind and a little weather and melt the hearts of the strongest men. You know, what's a storm? That's nothing but high and low pressure banging into each other. And that's nothing, you know, high and low pressure is just caused from the unequal heating and cooling of the Earth's surface. What's that? We can figure that out. We know that from physics. Hot air, cooler air, they get together, they don't like each other, and they kind of, you know, lightning bolts start flying. That's nothing more than positive and negatively charged particles in the air, in the water. And yet, God can make that to where the hardest, most seasoned professionals are afraid and doing stuff they don't normally do. Like, oh, I don't know, sailors having a prayer meeting? <laughs> Probably not. Throwing their cargo overboard? Probably not. Finally throwing a man overboard? And see, that that's the one good part of the sailors is they didn't want to do that. Sailors knew that once you're in the sea, you've got no chance. So they even, before they did it, they prayed to Jonah's God to say, don't, please don't hold us accountable for this man's blood. Why would they pray that? Because they know once he's in the sea, he's done. They weren't too far wrong. Now, was it a whale? Was it a giant shark? Was it a who knows? Who cares? He wasn't chewed up. <laughs> well, the fact of the matter is God, God took his options away. And that's what this is all about. I am not an option. I never was. And if you push me aside and think that it's going to be okay, ooh, like I said, when God has something for you to do, you will know it very plainly to the point where God will say to you literally in one way or another, do you have any questions? If you do, that now is the time to ask of that, you see. So chapter 2 tells us, we see this great confession, Lord, save me, save me, I can't save myself. Well, that's the truth <coughs> of all of us. That is the fundamental, foundational truth of, of Christianity. By no other name can you be saved. If God doesn't save, you ain't going to be saved. You want to go half your life struggling, fighting like Ecclesiastes, trying women and song and wine and possession and knowledge and all this other stuff? Fine, you're just wasting your time. Because in the end, as he says at the end of Ecclesiastes, when all's said and done, everybody's been heard, all options have been played out, there's God. Behind it all, there's God. Albert Einstein, one of the mind greatest brains on the planet. He was not a Christian man, but by the end of his life, he became one. And the reason, he says, the farther I look into science, the farther, if I'm honest with myself, the farther I look into science and I understand uh, just a fraction of this universe's workings, the more I'm convinced that there is a God. That was Albert Einstein's whose life was steeped in science, mathematics. He didn't give a hoot and a holler about theological or mythological gods. But yet there at the end of his life, he says, perhaps I should call upon this God now. For I have 
wasted my life searching for answers that only he can provide. Wow, that's Einstein. That's not Joe Blow down on the corner. One of the most brilliant minds ever finally came to the conclusion, God is, and I ain't. The great I am and the great I ain't. God is not, God never was, an option. Now, it took this guy three days in a whale to figure that out. And he vomits Jonah up. That must have been a sight to see. And God's going to say to him, now, what? I got something for you to do, John. I can't quite remember what it was. Do you recall? I got to go to the capital of the worst people, of the mightiest army, the nastiest, bloodthirsty cult I've ever known, who hates Jews, by the way, especially Jews that have been on fish three days. And I got to tell them to behave themselves. I can see God's big old smile right on the money. And you know what? You're going to walk. <laughs> There's no mass transit. So I'm assuming God barfed him up back over here on the Israeli soil. And he still had to travel probably a couple of months to get to Nineveh. You all know how the story ends? Dun, dun, dun. Tune in next week. Same bat time, same bat channel. But the story isn't over with Jonah. That's just the first half. The story actually ends with Nahum 40 years later. Jonah's just the tip of the iceberg. God's going to aggravate another guy named Nahum. Now, Nahum's a little smarter. Just a little bit. Don't read it in advance, Barbara. I don't know if you... She always does. <laughs> You're one of those people that goes to the end. How's this thing end? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> anyway, yeah, I'm getting some feedback. Everything I say, I hear twice. It's like there's two me's in the room. <laughs> anyway, uh, we'll do chapter three next week, and then if you want to do Nahum, that's just right down the street. Oh yeah, we probably should not, huh? Cook off. I'm going to be in that too. What we cooking? Soup. Oh. Category of soup. Any kind of soup you want. For the hot week. <laughs> For the hot week. <laughs> hey, I didn't plan that. <laughs> Make a request. Is there going to be Sunday school? Uh huh? Is there going to be Sunday school? That's what we're deciding right now. Probably not. Let's just say no Sunday school next week. Okay. Because of the cook-off, they're going to be noisy and making noise and all kinds of stuff. <laughs> and besides, I'm going to be preparing the championship soup.